Hello. Good morning. Hey. We're going to give just a few minutes for folks to show up, but we have a pretty full uh, agenda today. Actually, we'll we'll, we'll give another uh, two minutes, uh, both so I can get organized and so. Uh, So happy holidays, everyone. I hope everyone has recovered from KubeCon. I just, uh, I got back the day after KubeCon and promptly had a cloud native upper respiratory minor virus. So uh, I'm now finally healthy with my whole brain back. Um, and we're about to head into Thanksgiving. So uh, Alex, I see you're here. Do you, did you wanna go at the top of the hour for timing uh, reasons? If you like, you can go now or I can more op formally open the meeting and cover news first. Yeah, I've got no strong preference. That's fine. I can wait a few minutes. Don't worry. It's absolutely fine. Okay, cool. So uh, welcome all. Uh, it's 12.01, so we'll get going. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I want to say welcome uh, to Tag Observability's uh, November 21st meeting in 2023. This is the first uh, meeting post KubeCon. Um, I hope everyone had a good time if you went. And if not, uh, the videos will be out shortly uh, next week, I think. Uh, I'm going to be going two or three more times because there were so many talks that were so cool all at the same time. Uh, but this is a CNCF uh, event. Uh, the code of conduct please uh, does apply. Uh, please don't do or, or say anything uh, in chat uh, that would be in violation of that code. Uh, I am throwing a link to the meeting minutes uh, in the chat. They're also in the invite. Please do feel free to uh, let us know you're here. Uh, and uh, even though we do have a full agenda, if there's anyone here for the first time, uh, please uh, introduce yourself briefly. <laughs> And then we'll get on. We, we've we've got a number of talks um, uh, and presenters uh, on a couple of really important topics. I think that uh, you'll be interested in. So, is there anyone here for the first time? Oh. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know what order you want us to go in. Take <laughs> um, so your going first, and uh, we'll just sounds, sounds, it sounds like it. all right. Hi, I'm Nate uh, Nate W. I'm a developer advocate with the uh, CNCF. Um, and uh, there I've got two primary roles. Uh, one, I help uh, projects organize and uh, write their documentation, usually in that order, because I don't scale all that well myself. Uh, and then I also help uh, folks, um, projects uh, uh, with the uh, mentoring programs uh, that the uh, CNCF runs. So, uh, and today uh, I'm here uh, because I heard um, potentially there's a new website in the work and I might be able to help. Hi, I'm Colin. Uh, I te uh, tech lead our observability team at Cloudflare. Um, I'm in Melbourne, Australia, so it's uh, currently 4 a.m. Okay, wow. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Adam Hackle. Uh, I'm a senior SRE at a uh, nonprofit organization called Samaritan's Purse. Uh, so just sat in a bunch of the uh, sessions in QCon and just kind of hanging out and seeing what's going on. Uh, I'm Parth. Um, so uh, one of the, the maintainers on the Guac project was this open SSF project and also one of the co-founders for our supply chain security company called Kusari. Good to meet everybody. And uh, I'm Mike. Uh, I'm also a, a maintainer on Guac and co-founder uh, co of Kusari, as well as um, a CNCF tag security lead and um, an open SSF uh, technical advisory council member. My name is Anae. I'm the open source developer advocate at Acro Security. And I just found through Slack some interesting issues. So I thought I'm gonna join a meeting. Welcome. I think that's all the new faces. Uh, Nir, you've been here before, right? So uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so uh, with that, we have a, we have three different uh, uh, topics. Uh, we're just going to launch into the first one. Uh, Alex, take it away. Uh, I met Alex for context at uh, KubeCon in person, and and we had a lovely chat. Uh, and he's the author of Alehim Alehim Pilyu. Thanks, Matt. Um, let me know if you can't hear me at any time, or if there's anything on my screen you can't see. But I'll jump straight into it. I'll try and time box it to seven to ten minutes if that's okay. Uh, just give me one sec. 
So I'm here to talk to you today about a project uh, called KateGPT. Um, hopefully you'll see why it's applicable uh, to this tag and why I would love to get your thoughts on it. But firstly, can you see my screen? We all good? Yep, great. So um, let's talk about things really quickly. I just want to be economical of your time. So how do we get here? So we know there's a, a zeitgeist around AI at the moment. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to you about why I think this is interesting from an observability perspective, because I think there are some practical uses for AI that we're, we're just skipping and people just don't seem to see. Really, from my perspective, I've worked as a uh, director of Kubernetes development for MicroKates, um, Charmed Kubernetes, and a little bit in the K3s world as well. And throughout all this time, there was tons of problems that we came up against um, around how to filter through log data, events, and effectively derive meaning. And, you know, lo and behold, AI is great at pattern, pattern recognition, translation, and prediction. And the problems that I have uh, pattern recognition, translation, and prediction. So I said I worked with Kates. Well, as some of you folks know, with Kates, you get a convey about problems. And those problems usually manifest themselves in really complex uh, and, and Byzantine error messages, um, really difficult to understand remediation practice. But the worst of all is as an SRE, and this is the, the observability overlap, it's where it starts. SREs tend to crystallize knowledge in their heads, right? It becomes tribal knowledge, and it's very difficult to get that into a run book. By the time you do, you do it's stale, right? So kind of this is a high-level example. You got your SOS and your service logs, events, status, and we're expected to derive some kind of signal out of that noise. Um, and often it's very hard to find the sine wave uh, but between but behind all the noise. So this is where I had the idea of KSGPT. And um, I have to admit, I wrote off the name of, you know, ChatGPT. Um, there is no generative transformation in the, in the Golang component here, although it does derive through an inference API, which I'll talk about later on. But what, what really is it? What are these Kubernetes superpowers? Well, first and foremost, it's about trying to codify SRE knowledge. So all of these things you see there, all of those different resources, effectively have a bunch of Go files, and each one of those files does multiple different types of checks, like is PVC mounted, is PVC bound, is you know is pod running, et cetera, et cetera. So it's codifying and unit testable, uh, repeating knowledge. Now, there's no AI there, right? That's 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 simple. All I've done there is effectively write a, a control flow with a bunch of different tests. Where the AI comes in is where you take the outcome of that and we articulate it, as you can see here in a really easy to digest way. Oh, Kubernetes has an error, da, 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 da. You can see it's because of this, this, and this. We then combine that with output formats such as JSON, YAML, et cetera. And you've suddenly now got yourself the ability to run this as a gate in your CI CD. You've got it as a CR and this just exploded. I started this in KubeCon in Amsterdam, just off the back of an idea. I should have taken a few moments to introduce myself. I'm, I'm pretty active in, like, I used to be on the governing board of Keptin. I started the Open Feature Project and a bunch of other CNCF stuff. But this is where I got really involved in this space. What was interesting as well is that, uh, as a time check, we're almost at 10 past, um, we have got a bunch of contributors um, who have all come from different spaces. And the thing that I think is kind of interesting, as I said, is the secret source here, is that we have effectively codified a lot of this stuff, rather than just using this as a, as a thin jet, chat GPT wrapper, we actually have a pretty interesting architecture was, as I said, we will scan your cluster for a bunch of different stuff, package the responses up into something meaningful. So effectively, KGPT is a signal generator, just like a trace generator or a logs or a metrics generator. This is the now, now a kind of an apex level uh, generator that sits at, on top. Uh, as of which you can actually then leverage this by scraping the Prometheus endpoint on KGPT to detect whether or not there are um, results that have been found. And if there are, you can trigger alarms. So the architecture, as I'm just zooming through here to be economical again with time, allows you to deploy either an operator into the cluster or run it as a CLI. And what you're able to do is to figure out a bunch of these default analyzers. It has integrations with tools like, like Trivi, so we can actually priority order CVEs. And we leverage the LLMs to effectively just simplify the error messages. And this is really not something I've seen done uh, by other people. So I'm going to do a one minute demo. Basically, here we are. I've got a cluster running locally. We see K9s. Uh, this is just on my local machine. I've got a few problems. I'm going to run KHGPT analyze. And what you can see, one second. What you can see now is that with KGPT Analyze, it's going off and doing a bunch of stuff. It's going to take a moment because I've got a ton of CVEs on this cluster. And you can see what we're able to do is now actually detect the issues with those CVEs uh, and actually bring them back in a meaningful way. And what we can do even more so is we can actually apply the... Sorry, my, my daughter is next to my feet here. We can apply Dash E, which actually then allows the AI to 
go and enrich these results and come back again with a more meaningful error message that can say, hey, you want to remediate it, this is what you do. Again, I'll save you the time because I've just set this cluster up, but what we'll come back with is say, if you want to fix this particular, this particular uh, CVE, this is how you do it. So why am I showing this to you today? Well, because what we want to do is bring it towards being a sandbox project in the CNCF. This isn't a company behind it, we're a community, and oh, our, our ambition is to, sorry, my kid is climbing on my lap. Our ambition is oh. to get this into the sandbox so that we can try to help people be more effective as SREs, and also because we think that this bridges the gap between cloud native and AI. Right, that's the end of my spiel. Wow, that was like a lightning talk. I love it. I want to. I want to. I want to have all of these. And please, uh, for 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 you and everybody else, don't ever apologize for holding your kid on your lap. <laughs> Thanks. One oh, one final thing I just wanted to say was um, the oh, reason. And welcome, by the way. Uh, we have some of the some of the that we didn't say hi to yet. So cool. I also wanted to bring this to your attention that as part of all this, we're introducing a new working group within the CNCF called Working Group Artificial Intelligence. You might think it's a little bit strange I'm presenting this to tag observability, but actually this kind of project, which is half signal generator, half debugging tool, has kind of found itself in limbo because the CNCF doesn't really have a way of consuming it and bringing it into the ecosystem. So one of the things I want to try and do is make uh, forge ahead to so the other projects that are that are in this space can have a have a working group and have eventually a tag that they can align to. So I hope that was interesting and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, uh, please, uh, everybody jump in. I'm gonna share my screen and uh, uh, just bring up uh, what Alex just made reference to, but uh, please, if there are any questions for Alex, uh, jump, jump on in. I also appreciate, I probably spoke at like a hundred miles an hour there. It's okay. Um, YouTube lets you speed up and slow down things. Um, I have a question. Uh, if someone wants to sure. engage with the project, uh, how do they do so? Uh, where do they go? Um, not, not with the working group, uh, but but with the actual uh, KHGPT. Uh, that's, a, that's a great, great question. So inside the, the, the Google doc, I put a link to the repo. In the repo, you can either engage directly through issues or you can join our Slack, our community at the bottom of the repo. And um, we're really happy to have contributors. We've had contributors from Hugging Face, from OpenAI, um, and from Cohere, you know, various people in the organization, engineers and whatnot, all build back end. So one of the things I didn't mention is it's not just hard coded to OpenAI. KHGPT works with local AI inference as well. I was trying to be kind of tight on time, but that's one of the most exciting things here is that we've actually now got an opportunity to create a feedback loop where we're actually able to serve our own models in cluster, read the telemetry that comes from the uh, KHGPT and then refine those models and inputs. Uh, so I had a question in terms of like, is is this like a CLI output or is there is there like an API around it that you can do some more things with it and to, you know take this data elsewhere? Absolutely. There's there's three different ways. So there's a CLI, there's a gRPC API that can be served either from the CLI or from the Kates operator. The Kates operator actually has custom resources called results that you can then use. And actually the way the uh, the Prometheus endpoint works is we'll serve out the, the aggregate of those results and, and we label them so that they're useful then for alarming, alerting, putting into Slack, we've got an integration with as well. Cool. Um... Thank you. Uh, is there any other questions? Uh, oh, hey, VJ. I saw that you just joined. Hey, Matt. Good morning. Good morning. Um, right. So, uh, so issue number 1200 in the TOC repo, also the baud rate of my first modem, um, which dates me, <laughs> um, uh, is uh, something that Alex initially drafted. And uh, then uh, about a month or a month and a half of weekly meetings went on to refine the mission and, and whatnot. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we talked about at KubeCon when we had the TOC and TAG chairs meeting, which I'll provide an update uh, in, in written form to the TAG observability channel a little later, rather than take up a lot of time here. Uh, but we, you know, one of the active topics that we're always talking about is: Do we have the right number of tags? Should we have more tags? You no, know, a lot of tags are, are wanted, or should we keep the existing um, tags and consider them more like foundational uh, domain uh, specific tags? And then for some stuff like this AI working group that's going to look at 
the issue that wasn't that issue. Uh, that actually is a collaboration between uh, tag runtime uh, and tag observability, uh, since it's sort of germane to both and consistent with both charters. And that way, we you know we don't want to have more tags further diffusing our resourcing. So so you know we're we're working together uh, on this one, uh, and and so that's why in the doc you'll see that there are four sort of sponsoring co chairs. Uh, to launch the thing, and then the future is up to it um, in terms of its outputs um, for context. Yeah, uh, Mike, uh, do you have a question? Oh yeah, yeah, real quick, uh, just to, to take off my CNCF hat and put on my OpenSSF hat. Uh, I, I I'm pretty sure um, since we also have a similar AI ML sort of security working group there, I, some of the stuff you showed off, I think would be really interesting to, to show off to some of the folks in OpenSSF as well. Obviously there's some folks who, who share uh, there, but, uh, but we'd love to, to, I think, have um, to see that as well, because as we kind of are looking to build similar sorts of tools, not just for Kubernetes, but for you know GitHub and all sorts of other things would be also useful as well. Um, absolutely. I'm so happy you said that. Um, uh, one of the... <laughs> One of the th one of the callouts uh, for in scope activities uh, is to do uh, uh, just as you just as, as you mentioned. Um, can I highlight one? Uh, yes. Um, elsewhere, we also call out, I believe the open SSF somewhere. Um, but 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 the, the 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 working group one of the things that exists to do is to reach out across you know to other foundations uh, which are which are germane uh, again uh, because it's you know we're all open source together right so. Um, Okay, so if that's all the questions, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, I believe um, this has a bright future. If you're interested in the issue, please read up on it um, and join the Slack group. Uh, it's just getting launched. Um, and, you know, uh, if you're not a super expert uh, in the mathematics of artificial intelligence, you're probably exactly the kind of people that need to show up uh, because, we, um, you know, we, we need a broad sec. Uh, broad swath of folks that represent really, this is my personal take, but we're, you know, tags exist to bring together uh, end users, so companies uh, and, and individuals using CNCF projects, uh, project contributors and maintainers, and then vendors uh, that, that, that help end users uh, do that. And those three groups come together. Um, and so uh, all three of them are going to be interested in the output of, of, of that working group. And, and I think uh, what our next speaker is going to talk about uh, as well. So Kara, if, if you're ready to go, um, uh, we have a tradition of self-introduction, but I will say I've uh, worked directly with Kara. Uh, we go back uh, a number of years. Uh, as a very, it's a two-digit number of years um, that, that we've been friends. Uh, so uh, uh, I'll let her introduce uh, what she's talking about, but um, she's a recognized expert in her in her field. And I think, um, I think uh, given some of the uh, uh, keynotes that were at KubeCon, and, and some of the overall uh, trends in our ecosystem and our overall desire, again, to be able to hire more teammates and grow our tents. Um, um, yeah. Thank you for the intro, Matt. And um, yeah, as, a, as an end user in an enterprise company, uh, Alex will definitely be interested in, in taking a look at your project and uh, I will be taking that back to my teams. Uh, I'm a senior engineering manager at VMware. Uh, my name is Kara and uh, I've worked uh, uh, when I first got into the Kubernetes space, I was working with Octant, and now I'm working with Cartographer within the Tanzu supply, uh, Tanzu application platform. So working with supply chains and um, CDEs and things like that. So that was fascinating. Uh, I really look forward to to taking a closer look. Um, today I'm talking about something that is seems slightly orthogonal, but I promise that it's uh, uh, something that everyone should have their fingers in at least a little bit. Uh, I'm going to be talking about accessibility. Uh, and how it applies. So uh, I will share my screen. All right, and hopefully everyone can see that. All right, so this is a, a quote from uh, uh, kind of a leader in, in design and uh, has written a book on future ethics from, uh, I'm sure I will butcher this, but Kenwith Bowles. Uh, and says, whenever you design, you're making a claim about how the future should be. You're putting forward an argument about which technology should exist in our future world, how we should interact with them, and by extension, how we should interact with each other. And I think that's a lot of what, uh, in particular, the CNCF is doing. Uh, and so um, uh, for accessibility, you want to make sure that when you, as project maintainers, uh, when you're designing, that you're designing tools that everyone 
can use um, and are, are future proofed in that way. Um, so uh, there, but there are many reasons why you want to make your products and your projects accessible. Um, for me, uh, I, I have uh, kind of personal reasons for why I care. Uh, and that's because I have a son with disabilities. Um, and so this is, this is my son Beckett uh, and our, our giant breed dog. Uh, and he has nonverbal learning disorder. And so we really struggled when he was very young finding accessible projects like um, uh, speech to text, his voice was, his speech was garbled and then using kind of the Chrome extensions, trying to find mice that would uh, adapt for his, oh, there goes the dog, uh, uh, mice that, that were something that he could use because he had gross and fine motor skill delays. So uh, accessibility is always near and dear to me. So on the other side of it, why do companies care? It really comes down to money if you're trying to work with enterprise companies. Uh, a VPAT is required by the federal government and anyone who gets money or grants from the federal government. So this is all your TLAs, your three letter acronyms. So any government entity is going to require that your products are accessible. Uh, and so this is this goes to if it's a school, if it's a museum, uh, any anything, any company that you're selling to um, that that is. Uh, that requires that gets money from the federal government, it's it's going to require that you're accessible. So this is really uh, important to think about. And if you're not accessible, and there's another product out there that does something similar to what you do, they're going to go with the more accessible product. So just something to keep in mind. So these are the terms that you want to be really familiar with. Section 508, at least in the U.S., uh, Section 508, VPAT, and Everybody says this differently, either WCAG or WCAG, they'll just spell it out. And what are they? Uh, Section 508 was enacted in 1973, but really um, this was uh, part of the Rehabilitation Act, but it didn't, um, it, it wasn't enforceable. So it was part of the, this huge overhaul that happened in the government that helped those folks with disabilities and uh, it, even though it was our first stab, uh, you know, when technology started uh, coming to the forefront, it, it wasn't something that you could do anything about. So, you know, if you failed in your accessibility attempts, nobody cared. But in, two, in 2017, they uh, revised it. And when they revised it, they allowed companies to be sued if they weren't accessible. So you started seeing it a lot in like New York housing, uh, if you didn't have elevators. And um, that was kind of part of these laws. But when it became, uh, when it was part of tech, it was uh, if you didn't, if you weren't accessible to all users, um, somebody who uh, is blind uh, or has low vision, um, you needed to make sure your website was accessible to them. So um, there are lots of companies who have fallen under this. These are companies that have recently been sued. Uh, and these have been huge cases, enormous cases. These companies have lost a lot of money because they haven't been accessible. So it is important to pay attention, uh, even if they use a third party component, if they're using a third party widget and it's embedded in their code. Uh, and it's not accessible, they're liable. Uh, so uh, what's a VPAT? It's a voluntary product accessibility template. Uh, and uh, it, it, uh, the reason it's voluntary is you don't have to do it, um, but we do provide it. At VMware, we create a VPAT for every single one of our products. Um, and we say, how compliant are we with the WCAG, with the WCAG? Um, and, uh, it's a little bit of a pain. You go through and you you test your product, uh, but uh, then there's a standard for the WCAG, um, which is was 2.1, but 2.2 just came out. So I recommend that you make yourself familiar with the WCAG. Um, and uh, but the VPAT really is like a report card. You say how close you are to being compliant, um, and hopefully once a year you go through and uh, you test it with uh, the various tools that are available for. Um, color blindness, just a Chrome plugin, um, or screen readers. Uh, you can just go through and test your test websites and test products, test CLIs, things like that. Make sure they're accessible. Um, so WCAG is um, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, these are available online. It just makes rec recommendations. And it has three levels. There's A, AA, and AAA. So A is you have to satisfy the most 
basic accessibility features. What you want to shoot for is the ones, is the double A, the ones that you should satisfy, um, which are the most common ones. And then AAA is you may satisfy. And a lot of companies choose not to do the highest level of accessibility. Um, but this is this just makes um, it very clear. Uh, these guidelines make it really clear how, um, how you can make your projects accessible to all users. Um, and uh, it, it's just a, a step-by-step. -step. Uh, and it says, if you have this issue, then this is how you fix it. So uh, while it can be tedious to kind of go through this process, it's not difficult. It's uh, And uh, like I said, I highly recommend it. Um, and how this ties into um, uh, observability is that a lot of you are building tools for observability uh, that go to end users. And, and this will be important in, in the future. Uh, like I said, if it's, um, if it's something that's going to be used by an enterprise project or product, uh, you're going to want to be able to make it accessible to all people because those enterprise programs or those enterprise companies uh, are going to need to sell it to government entities or government funded entities. Uh, so that's about it. Hopefully I didn't take too much time. Uh, and there's a lot more to it, but that's a quick overview. Thank you so much, Kara. Um, uh, I, I want to open it for questions, uh, but but first provide a brief bit of context. Uh, so coming out of, out of KubeCon, I, I alluded to one of the keynotes. Uh, there's a new uh, working group uh, that spun up uh, uh, that, that had a very tangible impact. They had uh, interpreters, ASL interpreters uh, at KubeCon, um, uh, funded by the CNCF. Uh, and there's a working group you know, uh, that, that did that. And one of its outcomes and outputs was that. And so Karen and I were talking about, you know, KubeCon and what, what looked cool and what didn't, uh, what everything looked cool, but, you know, <laughs> Um, uh, and, and I got to thinking, you know, the, UI, the user interfaces and the user experiences that are going to come out of and are already coming out of the observability and analysis sector of the CNCF uh, have as their, as their task to convey some of the more complicated concepts, uh, you know, uh, to users uh, in a way that the wetware between our ears can understand. Um, uh, and so, you know, it seems like while this topic is broadly applicable, uh, a working group that would probably collaborate with other tags, such as tag contributor strategy uh, for to start with, which has other sorts of guidelines, uh, could make a lot of sense. And just like tags exist for those three demographics, uh, here again, you know, if you're an end user, you might want a shopping guide, right? Uh, if you're a project maintainer uh, who might one day become a vendor or both of those groups you know, vendors are going to want to say, want to be able to brag about, yes, we're accessible. That's a that's a differentiator in a, in a field that's growing in its scope. Um, uh, and then similarly, if you're launching a product, you know, a lot of times those first user interfaces come out of the open source project, right? It's it's people who are, are doing the, the, the project and are not always enterprise um, uh, front end engineers with experience and in some of the things that, that Kara mentioned. So so thank you, Kara, for, for introducing us to some vocabulary. Um, I, I predict that there will be an issue opening up soon. And, and just like uh, with the AI working group, those that are interested can jump in. Uh, and I, th I think personally, but not with my coach hat on, but actually with both of them on, um, that it would make sense to, to explore um, what it would mean to, to launch a working group. And again, I think in the observability space, we've got a great uh, place to start because if we can make observability UIs that are, we're talking about what's going on with like global cluster farms uh, accessible, then, you know, uh, it might do well to, to to set the pace for the rest of the sec the rest of the tags and domains. Um, but any questions for Kara? Um, um, so one question, I guess, is is so if if folks are interested in, um, so I guess one question is is how do you see like open source and their applicability to some of that? Because obviously, when you have a lot of volunteers. Um, uh, you know, volunteers can come in around like, oh, well, we'd love to implement these things, but I only have so many, much, so much time in the day. How do you see like what can be done to help facilitate that and, and help uh, folks who, who are often coming in for, as like a volunteer to sort of say, hey, this is important. You should be doing this. Yeah, it's a great question. I think it might be in the form of um, uh, kind of templates and ways to um, 
take all the information, kind of synthesize all the information, maybe even within this working group uh, and say, and get quick starts uh, up and running so that it's not everybody reinventing the wheel, going and out to all of these various links uh, in order to observe it, but saying, as you get your project started, you know, if you're entering the sandbox, um, here are the things that you should have kind of ready to go so that as you get started, you don't have to, the, the very difficult thing to do with accessibility is do an audit way down the road and have to, to refactor it. That's incredibly hard. But if we can get everybody up front when they enter the sandbox and say like, just do this up front, so much easier. So maybe it's just getting a quick start and um, uh, saying like, this is the, this is the, the way to get started. Yeah, absolutely. I think materials as well uh, for project maintainers and, and vendors and end users, right? The same data could be kind of cast in three different directions, I think, um, and be useful to all three for sure. Um, yeah, the first time I did a VPAP for a large project, we had something like 700 bugs and having to go back and fix it, it was awful. It was absolutely horrific. So the earlier you can get it done, the better. Yeah. Cool. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, I think we're actually right on time at the half hour here. Um, uh, so uh, we, we kind of have uh, two two topics uh, left for today. One sort of a preview, uh, and then uh, Mike uh, and Parth are going to round it out talking about the graph for art understanding artifact composition, a project that I've been following for a number of years uh, and I'm using uh, in a couple of different contexts um, uh, uh, as a hobbyist, but also as a as a as someone with a day job. Uh, um, uh, but uh, Anir, uh, do you want to talk uh, uh, for a few moments really about, you know, what, what your project is? Uh, you, you've dropped some notes uh, in, into tag observability, and I think in the future as part of a, a formal sandbox application, there will be another, you know, more, more in-depth presentation, but I do want to give you the opportunity to say hi uh, formally uh, here and... Um, yeah, uh, so so hi everyone. Uh, I'm Nir, I'm uh, CEO of uh, Traceloop, um, and we built uh, Open Elementary, which is a set of extensions for Open Telemetry, uh, specifically focusing on instrumentations for uh, language models for like OpenAI and Tropic and others, uh, vector databases, Opine Conchroma and others and uh, frameworks, like Gen AI frameworks, like Langchain, Llama Index, and, and others. Um, the reason we decided to build it as a, as a separate, like a separate repo and not part of open telemetry is because there are some things that we've been doing which are not like orthodox open telemetry. Uh, for example, we've been uh, putting uh, prompts as part of uh, attributes of uh, spans that we send and we uh, and we added more semantic conventions for how to define you know prompts completions and, and things that you want to report uh, when you have an LLM pipeline uh, so we also uh, extended it a bit uh, and and with time it grew enough that it like it kind of makes sense to have it like as a separate project uh, it's still completely compatible with open telemetry uh, so that like even the, like you can if someone is using the SDK you can connect it to all the observability platforms that support open telemetry today and we see a lot of uh, our users that actually do that today uh, and we are also applying to uh, to CNCF uh, and for that uh, I hope uh, we'll get to do a, like a full review before uh, before mid December I think Yeah, I, I want to be clear that um, um, uh, I or no one on this call currently speak for timing and the TOC and sandbox applications. It's a very well formed process. We look mm -hmm. forward to perhaps seeing this part of that process, uh, but but you know we're not necessarily gatekeepers or or you know uh, just to just to level set. But but thank you, thank you so much. Um, yeah, but I, but I would love to hear like what if anyone has like any thoughts or comments, then like I'd love to hear that. And if we, if we have time, I don't know. Yeah. Again, um, uh, I think in a, in a future meeting, uh, we'll, I want to make sure we we we, we don't uh, uh, circumvent any any early processes. 
Uh, you've been very vocal on the channel, and I wanted to 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 say hi. Is there any, any are there any slides or any kind of like brief like this is the architecture of of the project that you'd like to cover, or do you want to postpone that for a future? Yeah, I, got, I haven't because they could just like last minute. I haven't really prepared. Yeah, sure. yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Uh, welcome, and uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, in future meetings uh, and online. Okay, um, without further ado, I think, uh, hey, look at that, 25 minutes, we're running we're on a schedule. Cool. Eric, uh, Mike. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, cool, cool. Um, yeah, give me one second here. I'll, I'll, I'll share some uh, slides and, and we'll also uh, have a little bit of a demo as well, as long as we get through. Um, I first ran into Mike while he's doing that in tag security um, a, a number of years ago, actually, uh, when when a lot of, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the warning bells were going off. Um, but I'll let, I'll let Mike take it from here. Okay. Sure. Um, okay, so uh, just to level set for some folks who maybe are not super familiar with supply chain security or have heard it, but really not sure exactly what it is. So supply chain security is about really um, securing the, or software supply chain security, I should say, is about securing the production and consumption of software, right? So it's about, um, securing like how you pull in dependencies, whether they are a different team in your organization or open source or from vendors. It's about, you know, making sure, hey, am I pulling in something that is not widely known to be vulnerable or or not obviously malicious, that kind of thing. And then when you're producing software, right, you want to make sure that you're doing all the right things to actually um, uh, ensure that the software you're producing you're providing enough information there that somebody who is consuming that software feels safe, right? It feels that, yep, you, uh, you know, you're not using uh, very vulnerable software as dependencies, or at least you have exceptions, or you know, you're providing enough information to say that it's not exploitable, that kind of thing. And the problem there is, so what's the problem with that, right? Well, uh, hold on, yep. So the, the problem here is our software supply chains are complicated. Right, and so this is uh, an example from some some basic sort of POC that we had done. On the right hand side here, we have um, some various packages, and then uh, you know we had some S bombs and S bombs for folks who are not familiar. Our software bills of material with some information there. Then we also had some salsa attestations, and salsa is is a build um, is a build framework, uh, or rather, it's a, it's a set of build requirements. Um, you know, for secure builds and the attestations around here, right? We have all this information that that's in here about different files, about different things that depends on different things, yada, yada. And, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's super complicated and we don't really like have a good way yet of, of, of analyzing it, right? We have this ability to pull in software bills of material, but often it's just like a single layer, right? Where we just say, Yep, this application that we're running has um, a dependency on log4j, but you have very little, you know, on a compromised version of log4j, but you often don't have a lot of context that actually all the applications we're using have uh, a vulnerability on that same version of log4j because all of them are using some common library. And so that's where sort of Guac comes in. So Guac is a knowledge graph of software metadata to answer security and supply chain um, questions. And to kind of level set a little bit, right, when, when thinking about the depth of software supply chain security, right, from the breadth perspective, it's really just about, you know, um, are we protecting, uh, and, and this is where observability comes in, right, are we essentially tracking and looking into how folks are writing software, how they're pushing software to our source repositories, how the build systems are pulling from those source, rep source repositories as well as third-party dependencies, as well as other internal dependencies. How is that all being packaged up and, and pushed out? And then eventually, how is that all being run in production? And, and are we tracking all of those things so that we can kind of figure out those unknown unknowns and do all sorts of other stuff like, you know, just normal monitoring, but also the observability piece as well. And so that's kind of the breadth of the problem. And then the depth of the problem here is, you know, we need to have a way of stating where did this thing come from, right? Because this is, uh, you know, security data, right? So you start off with something like a trust foundation. So this is, you know, for folks who are familiar with SIGStore, 
it's a way of essentially asserting that an identity is associated with something. So signing of, you know, a, a particular document. So that kind of leads into the next piece, which is software attestations. So that's where salsa, s bombs, etc., come in, where you might have an s bomb, and that s bomb is signed by the system that generated that s bomb. So now you know that that s bomb came from that system, and you have some level of provenance of like, yep, uh, that is a system under our control, or that came from a system we trust, or no, it didn't come from a system we trust, and we don't know what that signature actually is. Maybe that's something I don't, you know, maybe I don't trust that s bomb, that kind of thing. And so there's a bunch of information from that's coming from supply chain metadata. So this is like S bombs, salsa. There's now a new thing called VEX, which is vulnerability exploitability exchange, which is just a way of essentially providing exceptions to say, hey, no, we this we're not vulnerable to this piece, this vulnerability because um, we don't call that piece, we don't call the the vulnerable function, right? That sort of thing. We also integrate with a bunch of other stuff uh, there as well. You need all of that data to then flow into essentially some sort of database. In this case, a graph, uh, a graph data store um, called you know uh, Guac, where you can aggregate all that data, synthesize it so that you now are not just pulling in like, oh, I have an S bomb. It's what's the information in that S bomb that's interesting. You know, the the information is like X depends on Y, Y depends on Z, that kind of a thing. And with Salsa, like this build system built this thing with these inputs. And that helps you sort of then have a data store that you can then query and figure out interesting information and build lots of in nice integrations into. Then that's where, you know, policy is then built on top of that, where you can then come in and say, great, uh, am I vulnerable to this piece of software? Uh, this, this, am I vulnerable, sorry, am I vulnerable to this? Am I actually, uh, can this vulnerability actually be exploited? Um, you know, is there a major vulnerability in some core piece of my technology? You can start to begin to answer those sorts of questions. And so to go quickly here, um, uh, so we start off with, you know, like you have some S-bombs, you have some of this stuff. It just sort of is existing there. A lot of folks right now are just putting it into an S3 bucket, into some, some file share where it's like exists as a release in GitHub but you want to be able to now ingest it into something like Guac. But Guac doesn't just ingest it and just say, okay, great, we've ingested some S-bombs. We begin to sort of establish the connections between the software, right? We, and, and between the documents. So, you know, we might have information that, you know, X depends on Y, and then we have a salsa attestation on Y, and then we have some additional information, and then we actually have other S bombs that relate to some of the stuff in that salsa attestation. So we get to kind of, you know, we begin to, you know, you begin to figure out what do we know about our supply chain, and also importantly for the observability piece, we also know, hey, what is unknown? What seems to be missing in my supply chain? Do I have enough information? to actually make an informed decision on whether or not I'm vulnerable to something or am I missing some information? And so we begin to sort of uh, figure out gaps. We also, in Guac integrates with um, a bunch of upstream uh, open source uh, uh, databases like depths.dev and OSV, as well as OpenSSF scorecard to pull in all sorts of interesting information to enrich your software supply chain to help you better understand like what are my risks? Um, what am I missing? That sort of thing. Uh, yep. Uh, we, you know, and then also the other thing that's probably worthwhile here, and I know a lot of newer tools are starting to do this as well, is like we. This is not just a point in time because it's a living database. As vulnerabilities are discovered, as new interesting information is discovered, we can continue to enrich the understanding of the software supply chain. So that includes. Yesterday, there was no known vulnerability. Today, there's a vulnerability. I don't have to rescan anything. It just, hey, we look at the, you know, we look at the vulnerability database, we pull it all in, and now we can point to you, hey, you have a vulnerability over here, and these are all the pieces of software that it affects. Um, that allows us to then sort of do all sorts of nice little things, like we can do policy checks, like, hey, uh, no major vulnerability, you know, no critical vulnerabilities against, you know, this sort of software. Um, helps us do patch planning, which uh, uh, Parth will show off in a second here, and also help you identify what are the critical libraries that you might have, right? That like, oh, wow, all of our things all depend on this one library, right? And, and that might be something that you need to kind of do something about. 
And the other piece of this, right, is we want to make sure that the data can get it to the hands of the folks who need it when they need it. This is a bit of a contrived example from one of our POC um, VS Code plugins. But the idea here, right, is, is Guac itself, and I'll show this in a second, is a GraphQL API. It's intended to be... Um, uh, it, 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 it's intended to be very pluggable. It's intended to be very extensible. Um, it's intended to integrate with potentially other GraphQL uh, APIs as well, right? And with that, right, it allows us to sort of integrate, you know, create integrations so that folks can get the data the, the way in the hands, uh, get data to the folks who need it when they need it in the capacity that they need it, right? Like a developer doesn't want to get a report in an email that like, you know, two weeks down the line, they want to get, an immediate like, oh, in my in my Docker file, in my requirements.txt, in my Go mod, whatever, they want to see like a the red squiggly that says, whoa, 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 hold on, you're using something that you shouldn't be using. <laughs> and so uh, real high level at, at the architecture, you know, it's essentially we have a bunch of different integrations. It's based on gra it's a GraphQL API. We have stuff like um, some CLIs, we have an experimental visualizer, which once again, uh, as as uh, when you have a bunch of back end engineers trying to develop a a, a front end, you'll you'll see uh, this is kind of uh, what you get. But but we are looking to kind of um, work with the community to kind of build out better visualizations there. But all of this sort of goes into a database. We have a couple of different um, back ends that are supported right now. The big ones are Arango DB, um, and we also support uh, ENT, and we also have like an in memory sort of key value uh, component as well. And then we also ingest a bunch of different data from a bunch of different sources. And I'll just kind of move along real quickly so that, that Parth can get to the demo. Um, so we support SBOMs, VEXs, Salsa, OpenSSF, license information, um, Intoto attestations, Intoto being a, a CNCF project. We have a bunch of different supported collectors. Like, so we can pull from OCI registries, including referrers. So we can actually pull uh, documents that are kept in OCI registries. Uh, we can collect from S3 buckets, file collectors, GitHub releases, and all that good stuff. So now I will uh, hand it over to Parth. All right, can everybody see my screen? Does that look good? Okay, yep. awesome. Okay, so yeah, so real quick, I know we're running short on time, so what I kind of wanted to quickly walk through is, is the patch planning example. Um, so, so if you remember, for, uh, for what it's worth, that we're the, the calendar invite says we end at fifty, but we you know I, I have until oh. after the till the hour and a little bit more, and the recording will will have it all. So so don't don't feel rushed. We if, if it goes okay. past the hour, folks might drop, but it'll all be on the recording. So. Got it. All right. Um, so the quick example I want to show here is if you remember a while back. Uh, I think it was like the curl, there was a curl, curl high severity vulnerability coming out, right? Um, and people were kind of panicking, but it turned out to be kind of like, oh, it was nothing kind of thing, right? But what what the, you know, a kind of a, that kind of a use case is kind of highlights the usefulness of Guac. It's like, because the maintainer kind of came out beforehand saying like, you know, uh, he, he made a post on, on GitHub saying like, oh, there is a high severity vulnerability coming out. It affected, you know, several years of versions um, and you know, and that's it. And you've been warned, right? Like he's like, that's it. Like go do something about it, right? And then the week later, kind of thing, the actual CVE, and then the you know the new version of curl was released. But until that point, people were kind of scratching their heads, like, hey, what's what's happening? What am I supposed to do? Um, so what kind of Guac allows you to do is like be proactive about some of this information. So you can, so you know, before knowing exactly, um, you know, like if before the vulnerability scanners and all those things get updated with the CVE information. Can you proactively know where in your supply chain curl exists and what is a patch plan in order to be to be ready if you need to go patch it kind of thing, right? Depending on whichever version it is. So the first thing you can do, for example, and this is a GraphQL uh, API that uh, Michael Michael was talking about. Um, this is a playground version of it, so you can actually you know write queries and so forth. So the, here is a specific query that we have within Guac, which is called find software. So for example, you know I know. I don't know exactly what packages, like curl packages I'm using, right? It could be Alpine, it could be Debian. How do I know, right? So I can, I can just, just do a search for curl and I, I wanna get all the packages back, for example. So if I run that query, right? And I already ingested some, uh, Quark is running in my on my computer at this point locally. So I have some data ingested already and you can see it from the SBOMs and other information that, that I've collected, 
I have an Alpine and I have a Debian and so forth. As you can see, like I didn't specify a version, right? Because again, right, the maintainer didn't specify a version. So what I want to do is like, hey, I want to be proactively ready and be like, I, I you know, whichever version of curl I'm using, I want to see where, like, what do I need to patch and be ready for it when the time comes. So the first thing we can do here is, as I'll clear this out, um, and that thing's getting blocked. Okay, here we go. Um, so you can see here, this is a quick CLI, uh, like Mike was saying, right? Is that we have a bunch of CLI tools around it. We also have a visualizer, but all this, there's a, you know, there's a GraphQL API. There's also a REST API that we're working on. So all this data is consumable, consumable in, in multiple different kind of formats. But here you can see uh, what we're going to do is look into that Debian package. And again, we're not specifying the version because we don't know. And we just want to be like, okay, based on this information, can I, can you tell me like what version of curl am I using, first of all, and then how do I go about remediating it, right? So in this case, it came back saying you have this one version, right? In the, in the data, data mod, you know, the demo data that I've ingested, specifically there's 7. You know, 7.74 is the, the curl version of Debian that's being used and it's being used by Python and Nginx. And I, it, it gives me this information here. And in this case, it looks like they're uh, images. So I know that either if they're base images or whatever they are, uh, I need to go update them to the whatever the latest release is when the time comes, and then that will remediate the the you know the curl vulnerability for that specific uh, for the specific uh, example here. And you can see it, it also comes comes out with like a, a URL down here, and I do have that uh, over here. So you can see this is that experimental UI that Mike was talking about. So you can see it's not not the greatest. Um, it's made by a bunch of backend engineers. So, but you can see visually, right? Like, okay, um, based on the data, based on like what you query for, you can see in a visual format, right? This this is the version of curl it and it, and uh, Python and Nginx both depend on that specific version. And that's what I want to go remediate. Um, other examples are like, for example, and this is a much bigger one. So I'll, I'll make it a little bit bigger here. So this is an example of querying, whoops, uh, querying for, um, querying for vulnerabilities. So, for example, like Log4j, if you remember, where where is Log4j in my in my uh, environment? So it, it kind of gives me that kind of visualization. So you can see uh, version two point eight one, and there it all goes down to uh, this package uh, OpenSSL. So OpenSSL has a bunch of uh, looks like yeah. So uh, Log4j uh, OpenSSL has a dependency on Log4 Log4j, um, and then that's the specific version of it. And then that's what we need to go. Uh, remediate. So this is a quick overview. There's a lot of different examples in terms of, you know, vulnerabilities. We can, we can analyze license information. We can, uh, you know, we can determine if there's, you know, is there a salsa attestation? Is there S-bombs associated with the package? You know, what, and if there's like a critical vulnerability, you know, like this, you know, for example, right, uh, maybe curl is being utilized by, you know, all your applications or your, this one specific dependency is being used by multiple different packages. You need to go focus on it. Maybe it has a low scorecard, right? Open SSF scorecard, which kind of judges in terms of like, hey, uh, how what's the upkeep on that project? You know, are there multiple maintainers? Um, is it regularly updated? And you know, are, are they cognitive cognitive of their security scores and all those kind of things? Like, if it has a low Open SSF scorecard, then you want to be again be like, hey, is something happening? So Guac can help you like pinpoint all that kind of things. At the same time, make all this actionable, right? So I'm showing this off as the visualizer, as, as the CLI, but like Mike was saying, you can use the API to, you know, use it in, uh, uh, for example, in uh, admission controller, right? And you can have it be like, if, you know, if, if you know, for example, if something is coming out of a new version, if you're building a new product and, you know, now you realize, oh, curl is something that I need to be careful about. Maybe you, you want to, you can mark curl, for example, curl package as bad. And then anything that relies on it will automatically get blocked running into production because like, hey, I want to update curl before I you know, push into production, for example, as a quick example. Um, so it's in, uh, it's in the repo, I, I can link it. I think it's linked in the, the documents. And you know we have a bunch of, um, it's an open SSR project. Um, it's a sandbox project. We have a lot of contributors from um, you know Google, Microsoft and, and so forth, like really looking into this and seeing the value. So I think that's uh, what I want to highlight here. Yep. Uh, um, just Quickly, uh, yeah. So incubating, not sandbox. Sandbox is, oh, is sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> but no, no. Um, uh, yeah. So, so, and we're obviously look. You know, uh, given that we have a lot of, um, cult, you know, most of us are also involved in CNCF, where we're looking to collaborate more with with CNCF as well. 
Um, and, you know, just as an example, right, you know, yeah, as, as Parth had mentioned, Microsoft and, and we have a, a Red Hat, Yahoo, et cetera. We have a lot of contributors from a lot of different places. Um, Microsoft has, has done some stuff to integrate ChatGPT into some POCs uh, so that folks don't have to write the, the, the GraphQL if they don't want to. But yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff there and, and we're, we're interested in seeing more from, uh, you know, uh, other folks, you know, uh, we have a community meeting, it's all under OpenSSF, blah, blah, blah. Feel free to, to join and, and, and whatnot. Thank you so much. Um... Uh, I have a question, but but for, but first, I just would like to to tack on uh, to provide some additional context. Like, why is this an observability thing, not a security thing? All right. Well, if you actually look at, for example, log for j was mentioned, but you could you could choose another one. Um, if you look at the real massive, massive cost of log for j that that woke so many people up, it wasn't because there was a lot of like exfiltration attacks and 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 user secrets exposed. It was the cost of figuring out what's running. Just that it was like all stop for. A big part of the economy, right? Um, in in the tech sector, at least. Uh, but but it was even felt more uh, acutely outside of the, the 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 tech sector to the end user community, where where they might not have large groups of engineers that do nothing but look at supply chain, right? They're they're, they're actually using things, and then there's problems, and how do we figure it out? We don't we don't know. So one of the reasons that I've been so fascinated by this particular project is because it serves up to observability tooling, all kinds of information about what's actually running at scale using a data model underneath that can actually scale to where, uh, you know, CNCF end users uh, reside, right? The, I mean, um, uh, in a deeper document, like, like to me, it's, it's Plinko, right? I have maybe tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of F-bombs per time unit being generated. Like, where do they go in a way that's queryable? It's, you know, big query, sure, um, for a lot of money per query. But like, you know, so, so we have a data store and a data model that surfaces up this for observability tooling to be used to correlate other things. Uh, there are also other CNCF projects like the Landscape Draft uh, that we highlighted a little bit last uh, last year that's firing back up now that now that th things are becoming more more real, uh, and the Guac project fills in a whole bunch of the subgraph modules by there. So, um, so with that, I'll, I'll ask you the same question I ask everybody um, uh, when they're talking about an open source project. Uh, uh, what's the contribution model? Are you open to contributions? Are there open meetings? Like, how could people get involved? Is it? Um... Yep. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, so yes, Let's yes. Tell us a little bit uh, about the project and, and how how it's yes. running. Folks want to engage in what capacity that they can they can. Um, so, also, uh, uh, if folks aren't familiar with the open SSF, maybe give a, give a TLDR. Yes. Yes. So the open SSF is a sister sort of foundation to the, um, CNCF. It all falls under like uh, so many foundations it, it falls under the Linux foundation. Um, so you have the CNCF, which is focused on cloud native, um, uh, and that includes cloud native security, but, uh, uh, the, um, open SSF is focused just more broadly on open source security. So that means um, both uh, open source from how do we secure open source, but also how do you get folks to secure the consumption of open source? So that's uh, that, that's definitely, um, so that's the, the open SSF in a nutshell. Uh, there's lots of different participants there. You know, obviously these meetings are all open. Feel free, you know, uh, as long as you abide by the open SSF code of conduct, which is I'm pretty sure just more or less the same as the LF. Uh, general code of conduct and the CNCF code of conduct. Um, but yeah, we we are, uh, you know, open to contributions. Um, you know, it's the, all the normal stuff that, you know, anything that you would imagine contributing to a CNCF project is more or less the same for contrib contributing to an open SSF project. And uh, yeah, so, you know, guac.sh is kind of just a community landing page. Um, you could go to the open SSF uh, website just to kind of, you know, we're on the open SSF calendar. We have a bunch of information in the community. We're on the open SSF Slack. So, Please, if you're on the OpenSF Slack, join the Guac Room, and uh, we can we can chat. Great, thank you so much. Uh, with that, are there any other questions? Are there any questions for for um, for the Guac project for Mike and, and Park? Okay, well, uh, it is twelve fifty nine. We're technically ten minutes over, but hopefully, we haven't taken anybody uh, uh, into their holiday plans. But we will. Um, I will look forward to seeing you all uh, in, a, in a few weeks' time. Uh, our next meeting will be the first Tuesday of next month. Uh, so, uh, thank you all. Um, 
I'll be posting a summary of this as well as at long last all of the videos since July. Uh, <laughs> Um, and, and, and we're at, we're enabling some automation. Uh, so this video should land later today. Um, thanks. And have a great holiday. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Bye.